Our next case is Moulton Brothers Incorporated versus Lemieux. And the first question, how did the lower court rule in this particular case? How did the lower court rule in this particular case? And as we've mentioned uh, a couple of times here, it's very important for you to understand where you are when you're reading these cases. It's important to understand um, you know, what, what the court is looking at, what the, uh, the appeals court is looking at uh, in, in your case book, like where are we in, in this litigation? So here's, here's the, the question, what, you know, what happened in the lower court? And essentially what happened was there was a, um, a, a, a claim in this, in this lawsuit. It was for a uh, foreclosure on a mechanics lien. And uh, there was a, 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 an appeal on this matter. And the lower court had, uh, after trial, found in favor of the defendants on the plaintiff's foreclosure claim, and pursuant to the first count of the counterclaim, discharged the mechanic's lien. The court found in favor of the plaintiff on the remaining counts of the defendant's counterclaim, the negligence and misrepresentation claim, and there was an appeal after that. So essentially, the, the, the court was you know, disposing of both sides' claims on, 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 on its action in the lower court. So there's an appeal because, uh, you know, the, the, as, as you will find, that <laughs> when people are dissatisfied in the lower court, they will bring an appeal. Question, what was the error by the lower court that was asserted by the defendant? In this particular case, what error by the lower court was asserted? And essentially, the defendant is saying, look, you know, I, I, I asserted a claim for a, a breach of contract, and the lower court made a mistake by not looking at my breach of contract claim. And as it turned out in this particular case, the, uh, the uh, appeals court agreed. So let's take a look and, and, and find out exactly what happened. Uh, what did this court say about pleadings? What did this court say about pleadings? And we are um, talking about appeal from the Superior Court of the Judicial District of uh, Tolland. And um, the question is, what did the court say about pleadings? What are pleadings? Now, we talked about this earlier, and, and we mentioned earlier that very often you will have an overlap. You will have situations where one area of law will overlap with another area of law, and that's what we have here, because we're talking about the pleadings, which is essentially a civil procedure matter. Pleadings are essentially the uh, documents that are filed in the commencement of a lawsuit. When the plaintiff files the summons, and com summons with notice and the complaint, and then the uh, defendant responds with a um, an answer, those are the pleadings. Uh, that's what they're called. Now, very often what happens is uh, what happened in this case, where there are counterclaims. And that's when the defendant is uh, served with a, a plaint, a, the plaintiff's uh, complaint. And the defendant says, hey, look, you know, I've got complaints about this guy. Let me, let me tell you what they are. And rather than start a whole uh, separate lawsuit, what, what the procedure calls for is for the defendant to assert counterclaims, not a complaint, but counterclaims against the plaintiff. So now both sides have, have um, accusations, uh, claims against each other. So the question is, what did the court say about pleadings in this, in this particular case? And the court said this, citing another uh, precedent. Pleadings have, their, pleadings have their place in our system of jurisprudence. While they are not held to the strict and artificial standard that once prevailed, we still cling to the belief, even in these iconoclastic days, that no orderly administration of justice is possible without them. Very often the court will be a little bit sarcastic, but you know, they're making their point. The purpose of a complaint or counterclaim is to limit the issues at trial, and such pleadings are calculated to prevent surprise. We don't want surprises in our course of law. It is, fundamental in our, it is fundamental in our law that the right of a party to recover is limited to the allegations in his pleadings. Facts found but not averred 
cannot be made the basis of a recovery, okay? Facts found but not averred, facts that you don't, you know, set forth in your pleadings, cannot be made the basis for recovery. You can't win on something you didn't complain about. Thus, it is clear that the court is not permitted to decide issues outside those raised in the pleading. So it's very important if you have a, a, a multiplicity of claims against someone uh, concerning a particular transaction, you have to bring it all in at the same time. You can't wait till later because it may be too late. You have to assert it all at one time. It is equally clear, however, that the court must decide those issues raised in the pleadings. This is one of the most important areas of law, that the court must decide issues that are raised in the pleadings. Now, in this particular instance, we have a situation where the defendant is saying that there was uh, no decision on its breach of contract claim. And what, what we had in this particular case was the lower court said there was no breach of contract claim. There was a claim that was labeled negligence and misrepresentation, but nothing that was labeled as breach of contract. So in this case, what happened was the uh, appeals court said, well, look, you know what? We are not that narrow. We're going to look into what was alleged in the pleadings and see what we come up with. And in this case, they said, you know what? There really was a breach of contract claim. And here's how we find it. The, def the, the, they, the, the, the party, the defendant relied on the plaintiff's representation as an experienced builder of quality homes and sought the plaintiff's services and signed a proposal for the construction of a home by the plaintiff. So now we've got a signed agreement, a, a signed proposal, okay? They further allege that once construction commenced, they complained to the plaintiff about numerous defects in the plaintiff's work. So now you've got them talking about defects in the work that they've contracted for, for which they've contracted. And despite the plaintiff's assurances that the defects would be remedied, the plaintiff failed to cure the defects. So now, you know, we've got this uh, back and forth. Uh, finally, the defendants allege that they claim damages as a result of one or more of the following. Breach of the plaintiff's obligations in the proposal, incomplete work, unworkmanlike construction, construction with unsuitable materials, and construction or design which are not in accordance with sound engineering standards. So there you are. The court looked at that language and said, you know what? We're not going to look at just the formality of whether or not the title said breach of contract. We look at what the facts are asserted in, this, in the pleadings, and we find that these pleadings do, in fact, assert breach of contract. And that's how the court came out in that case.